Welcome to the Logophile channel. Frank Belknap Long, author of The Hounds of Tindalos, and this week's story, The Space Eaters, was one of a small group of writers connected with H.P. Lovecraft, known as, appropriately enough, the Lovecraft Circle. This circle also included Texan Robert E. Howard, the creator of Conan the Barbarian and other sword and sorcery tales, Californian writer and artist Clark Ashton Smith, Robert Block, author of Psycho, and Henry Kuttner. Long often based characters in his stories on his friends, and it should be no surprise that we have chosen to illustrate the narrator of this week's story as Long himself, and Howard as H.P. Lovecraft. It is possible that Long based the character of Henry Wells on Henry Kuttner, another of his friends. The Space Eaters contains many elements in common with other Cthulhu Mythos stories. Strange alien forces beyond the comprehension of humanity, bizarre dimensional and geometric anomalies, and even the power of the written word to break the minds of men, these are all hallmarks of Lovecraftian fiction and would be at home in any of the Mythos stories. But Long departs mordantly from Lovecraft's cosmic horror in one key respect, the introduction of Christian themes and language. God is invoked numerous times in this story, something that HPL eschewed typically, but the use of the Catholic cross is a marked departure from mythos stories. It is well known that Lovecraft held hostile views toward the Judeo-Christian tradition and took pains to distance himself from what he considered an inferior mythology from the Greco-Roman tradition. As HPL himself once said, if anything, he wanted to be considered a pagan. Long breaks from HPL in using Christian symbols, even if in the context of cosmic horror, where gods far different from Yahweh hold sway over a violent universe of chaos, a black sea of infinity. But this is too much of an academic discussion. You came to this channel to learn true but possibly to be entertained or even thrilled by another suspenseful tale of trans-dimensional aliens and mortal peril. And so you shall. We present Frank Belknap Long's terrifying tale, The Space Eaters. The Space Eaters by Frank Belknap Long The cross is not a passive agent. It protects the pure of heart and it has often appeared in the air above our sabbats, confusing and dispersing the powers of darkness. John T's Necronomicon Part 1 The horror came to Partridgeville in a blind fog. All that afternoon, thick vapors from the sea had swirled and eddied about the farm, and the room in which we sat swam with moisture. The fog ascended in spirals from beneath the door, and its long, moist fingers caressed my hair until it dripped. The square-paned windows were coated with a thick, dew-like moisture. The air was heavy and dank and unbelievably cold. I stared gloomily at my friend. He had turned his back to the window and was writing furiously. He was a tall, slim man with a slight stoop and abnormally broad shoulders. In profile, his face was impressive. He had an extremely broad forehead, long nose, and slightly protuberant chin, a strong, sensitive face, which suggested a wildly imaginative nature, held in restraint by a skeptical and truly extraordinary intellect. My friend wrote short stories. He wrote to please himself, in defiance of contemporary taste, and his tales were unusual. They would have delighted Poe. They would have delighted Hawthorne or Ambrose Bierce. They were studies of abnormal men, abnormal beasts, abnormal plants. He wrote of remote realms of imagination and horror, and the colors, sounds, and odors which he dared to evoke were never seen, heard, or smelt on the familiar side of the moon. He projected his creations against mind-chilling backgrounds. They stalked through tall and lonely forests, over ragged mountains, and slithered down the stairs of ancient houses and between the piles of rotting black wharves. One of his tales, The House of the Worm, 
had induced a young student at a Midwestern university to seek refuge in an enormous red brick building where everyone approved of his sitting on the floor and shouting at the top of his voice, Lo, my beloved is fairer than all the lilies among the lilies in the lily garden. Another, the defilers, had brought him precisely 110 letters of indignation from local readers when it appeared in the Partridgeville Gazette. As I continued to stare at him, he suddenly stopped writing and shook his head. I can't do it, he said. I should have to invent a new language. And yet I can comprehend the thing emotionally, intuitively, if you will. If only I could convey it in a sentence somehow. The strange crawling of its fleshless spirit. Is it some new horror? I asked. He shook his head. It is not new to me. I have known and felt it for years. A horror utterly beyond anything your prosaic brain can conceive. Thank you, I said. All human brains are prosaic, he elaborated. I meant no offense. It is the shadowy terrors that lurk behind and above them that are mysterious and awful. Our little brains, what can they know of vampire-like entities, which may lurk in dimensions higher than our own, or beyond the universe of stars? I think sometimes they lodge in our heads, and our brains feel them, but when they stretch out tentacles to probe and explore us, we go screaming mad. He was staring at me steadily now. But you can't honestly believe it's such nonsense, I exclaimed. Of course not. He shook his head and laughed. You know darn well I'm too profoundly skeptical to believe in anything. I have merely outlined a poet's reactions to the universe. If a man wishes to write ghostly stories and actually convey a sensation of horror, he must believe in everything and anything. By anything, I mean the horror that transcends everything that is more terrible and impossible than everything. He must believe that there are things from outer space that can reach down and fasten themselves on us with a malevolence that can destroy us utterly, our bodies as well as our minds. But this thing from outer space, how can he describe it if he doesn't know its shape or size or color? It is virtually impossible to describe it. That is what I have sought to do and failed. Perhaps some day, but then I doubt if it can ever be accomplished. But your artist can hint, suggest. Suggest what? I asked, a little puzzled. Suggest a horror that is utterly unearthly, that makes itself felt in terms that have no counterparts on Earth. I was still a little puzzled. He smiled wearily and elaborated his theory. There is something prosaic, he said, about even the best of the classic tales of mystery and terror. Old Mrs. Radcliffe, with her hidden vaults and bleeding ghosts. Maturan, with his allegorical Faust-like hero villains, and his fiery flames from the mouth of hell. Edgar Poe, with his blood-clotted corpses and black cats, his telltale hearts and disintegrating Valdemars. Hawthorne, with his amusing preoccupation with the problems and horrors arising from mere human sin, as though human sins were of any significance to a coldly malign intelligence from beyond the stars. Then we have modern masters, Algernon Blackwood, who invites us to a feast of the high gods and shows us an old woman with a hare lip sitting before a Ouija board, fingering soiled cards or an absurd nimbus of ectoplasm emanating from some clairvoyant ninny. Bram Stoker with his vampires and werewolves, mere conventional myths, the tag ends of medieval folklore, Wells with his pseudo-scientific bogies, fishmen at the bottom of the sea, ladies in the moon, and the 101 idiots who are constantly writing ghost stories for the magazines, what have they contributed to the literature of the unholy? Are we not the descendants of barbarians? Did we not once dwell in tall and sinister forests at the mercy of beasts that tear and rend? 
It is but inevitable that we should shiver and cringe when we meet in literature dark shadows from our own past. Hoppies and vampires and werewolves, what are they but magnifications, distortions of the great birds and bats and ferocious dogs that harassed and tortured our ancestors? It is easy enough to frighten men with the flames at the mouth of hell, because they are hot and shrivel and burn the flesh. And who does not understand and dread a fire? Blows that kill, fires that burn, shadows that horrify, because their substances lurk evilly in the black corridors of our inherited memories. I am weary of the writers who would terrify us by such pathetically obvious and trite unpleasantness. Real indignation blazed in his eyes. Suppose there were a greater horror. Suppose evil things from some other universe should decide to invade this one. Suppose we couldn't see them. Suppose we couldn't feel them. Suppose they were of a color unknown on Earth, or rather of an appearance that was without color. Suppose they had a shape unknown on Earth. Suppose they were four-dimensional, five-dimensional, six-dimensional. Suppose they were a hundred-dimensional. Suppose they had no dimensions at all and yet existed. What could we do? They would not exist for us. They would exist for us if they gave us pain. Suppose it was not the pain of heat or cold or any of the pains we know, but a new pain. Suppose they touched something besides our nerves, reached our brains in a new and terrible way. Suppose they made themselves felt in a new and strange and unspeakable way. What could we do? Our hands would be tied. You cannot oppose what you cannot see or feel. You cannot oppose the thousand-dimensional. Suppose they should eat their way to us through space. He was now speaking with an intensity of emotion which belied his avowed skepticism of a moment before. That is what I have tried to write about. I wanted to make my readers feel and see that thing from another universe, from beyond space. I could easily enough hint at it, or suggest it. Any fool can do that. But I wanted actually to describe it. To describe a color that is not a color. A form that is formless. A mathematician could perhaps slightly more than suggest it. There would be strange curves and angles that an inspired mathematician in a wild frenzy of calculation might glimpse vaguely. It is absurd to say that mathematicians have not discovered the fourth dimension. They have often glimpsed it, often approached it, often apprehended it, but they are unable to demonstrate it. I know a mathematician who swears that he once saw the sixth dimension in a wild flight into the sublime skies of the differential calculus. Unfortunately, I am not a mathematician. I am only a poor fool of a creative artist, and the thing from outer space utterly eludes me. Someone was pounding loudly on the door. I crossed the room and drew back the latch. What do you want? I asked. What is the matter? Sorry to disturb you, Frank, said a familiar voice. But I've got to talk to someone. I recognized the lean, white face of my nearest neighbor and stepped instantly to one side. Come in, I said. Come in, by all means. Howard and I have been discussing ghosts, and the things we've conjured up aren't pleasant company. Perhaps you can argue them away. I called Howard's horrors ghosts because I didn't want to shock my commonplace neighbor. Henry Wells was immensely big and tall, and as he strode into the room, he seemed to bring a part of the night with him. He collapsed on a sofa and surveyed us with frightened eyes. Howard laid down the story he had been reading, removed and wiped his glasses, and frowned. He was more or less tolerant of my bucolic visitors. We waited for perhaps a minute, and then the three of us spoke almost simultaneously. A horrible night. Beastly, isn't it? Wretched. Henry Wells frowned. Tonight, he said, I, I met with a funny accident. I was driving Hortense through Mulligan Wood. Hortense, Howard interrupted. His horse, I explained impatiently. 
You were returning from Brewster, weren't you, Henry? From Brewster, yes, he replied. I was driving between the trees, keeping a sharp lookout for cars with their lights on too bright, coming right at me out of the murk, and listening to the foghorns in the bay wheezing and moaning when something wet landed on my head. Rain, I thought. I hope the supplies keep dry. I turned round to make sure that the butter and the flour were covered up, and something soft like a sponge rose up from the bottom of the wagon and hit me in the face. I snatched at it and caught it between my fingers. In my hands, it felt like jelly. I squeezed it and moisture ran out of it down my wrists. It wasn't so dark that I couldn't see it either. Funny how you can see in fogs, they seem to make the night lighter. There was a sort of brightness in the air. I don't know, maybe it wasn't the fog either. The trees seemed to stand out. You could see them sharp and clear. As I was saying, I looked at the thing, and what do you think it looked like? Like a piece of raw liver, or a calf's brain. Now that I come to think of it, it was more like a calf's brain. There were grooves in it, and you don't find many grooves in liver. Liver is usually smooth as glass. It was an awful moment for me. There's someone up in one of those trees, I thought. He's some tramp or crazy man or fool, and he's been eating liver. My wagon frightened him, and he dropped it, a piece of it. I can't be wrong. There was no liver in my wagon when I left Brewster. I looked up. You know how tall all the trees are in Mulligan Wood. You can't see the tops of some of them from the wagon road on a clear day. And you know how crooked and strange-looking some of the trees are. It's funny, but I've always thought of them as old men. Tall old men, you understand. Tall and crooked and very evil. I've always thought of them as wanting to work mischief. There's something unwholesome about trees that grow very close together and grow crooked. I looked up. At first, I didn't see anything but the tall trees, all white and glistening with the fog, and above them a thick white mist that hid the stars. And then something long and white ran quickly down the trunk of one of the trees. It ran so quickly down the tree that I couldn't see it clearly. And it was so thin anyway that there wasn't much to see. But it was like an arm. It was like a long, white, and very thin arm. But of course it wasn't an arm. Who ever heard of an arm as tall as a tree? I don't know what made me compare it to an arm, because it was really nothing but a thin line, like a wire, a string. I'm not sure that I saw it at all. Maybe I imagined it. Not even sure that it was as wide as a string. But it had a hand. Or didn't it? When I think of it, my brain gets dizzy. You see, it moved so quickly I couldn't see it clearly at all but it gave me the impression that it was looking for something that it had dropped. For a minute, the hand seemed to spread out over the road, and then it left the tree and came toward the wagon. It was like a huge white hand walking on its fingers with a terribly long arm fastened to it that went up and up until it touched the fog, or perhaps until it touched the stars. I screamed and slashed Hortense with the reins, but the horse didn't need any urging. She was up and off before I could throw the liver or calf's brain or whatever it was into the road. She raced so fast she almost upset the wagon, but I didn't draw in the reins. I'd rather lie in a ditch with a broken rib than have a long white hand squeezing the breath out of my throat. We had almost cleared the wood and I was beginning to breathe again when my brain went cold. I can't describe what happened in any other way. My brain got as cold as ice inside my head. I can tell you I was frightened. Don't imagine I couldn't think clearly. I was conscious of everything that was going on about me. But my brain was so cold I screamed with the pain. Have you ever held a piece of ice in the palm of your hand for as long as two or three minutes? It burnt, didn't it? Ice burns worse than fire. Well, my brain felt as though it had lain on ice for hours and hours. There was a furnace inside my head, but it was a coal furnace. It was roaring with raging cold. Perhaps I should have been thankful that the pain didn't last. It wore off in about ten minutes. 
And when I got home, I didn't think I was any the worse for my experience. I'm sure I didn't think I was any the worse until I looked myself in the glass. Then I saw the hole in my head. Henry Wells leaned forward and brushed back the hair from his right temple. Here's the wound, he said. What do you make of it? He tapped with his fingers beneath the small, round opening in the side of his head. It's like a bullet wound, he elaborated. But there was no blood, and you could look in pretty far. It seems to go right into the center of my head. I shouldn't be alive. Howard had risen and was staring at my neighbor with angry and accusing eyes. Why have you lied to us? He shouted. Why have you told us this absurd story? A long hand? You were drunk, man. Drunk. And yet you succeeded in doing what I'd have sweated blood to accomplish. If I could have made my readers feel that horror, know it for a moment. That horror that you described in the woods, I should be with the immortals. I should be greater than Poe, greater than Hawthorne. And you, a clumsy drunken liar. I was on my feet with a furious protest. He's not lying, I said. He's been shot. Someone has shot him in the head. Look at this wound. My God, man, you have no call to insult him. Howard's wrath died and the fire went out of his eyes. Forgive me, he said. You can't imagine how badly I've wanted to capture that ultimate horror, to put it on paper. And he did it so easily. If he had warned me that he was going to describe something like that, would have taken notes, but of course he doesn't know he's an artist. It was an accidental tour de force that he accomplished. He couldn't do it again, I'm sure. I'm sorry I went up in the air. I apologize. Do you want me to go for a doctor? That is a bad wound. My neighbor shook his head. I don't want a doctor, he said. I've seen a doctor. There's no bullet in my head. That hole was not made by a bullet. When the doctor couldn't explain it, I laughed at him. I hate doctors, and I haven't much use for fools who think I'm in the habit of lying. I haven't much use for people who won't believe me when I tell them I saw the long white thing come sliding down the tree as clear as day. But Howard was examining the wound in defiance of my neighbor's indignation. It was made by something round and sharp, he said. It's curious, but the flesh isn't torn. A knife or bullet would have torn the flesh, left a ragged edge. I nodded and was bending to study the wound when Wells shrieked and clapped his hands to his head. Ah! He choked. It's come back! The terrible, terrible cold! Howard stared. Don't expect me to believe such nonsense! He exclaimed disgustedly. But Wells was holding on to his head and dancing about the room in a delirium of agony. I can't stand it, he shrieked. It's freezing up my brain. It's not like ordinary cold. It isn't. Oh, God, it's like nothing you've ever felt. It bites, it scorches, it tears. It's like acid. I laid my hand upon his shoulder and tried to quiet him. But he pushed me aside and made for the door. I've got to get out of here, he screamed. The thing wants room. My head won't hold it. It wants the night, the vast night. It wants to wallow in the night. He threw back the door and disappeared into the fog. Howard wiped his forehead with the sleeve of his coat and collapsed into a chair. Mad, he muttered. Tragic case of manic depressive psychosis. Who would have suspected it? The story he told us wasn't conscious art at all. It was simply a nightmare fungus conceived by the brain of a lunatic. Yes, I said. But how do you account for the hole in his head? Oh, that, Howard shrugged. He probably always had it. Probably was born with it. Nonsense, I said. The man never had a hole in his head before. Personally, I think he's been shot. Something ought to be done. He needs medical attention. I think I'll phone Dr. Smith. It's useless to interfere, said Howard. That hole was not made by a bullet. 
I advise you to forget him until tomorrow. His insanity may be temporary. It may wear off, and then he'd blame us for interfering. If he's still emotionally disturbed tomorrow, if he comes again here and tries to make trouble, you can notify the proper authorities. Has he ever acted strangely before? No, I said. He was always quite sane. I think I'll take your advice and wait, but I wish I could explain the hole in his head. The story he told interests me more, said Howard. I'm going to write it out before I forget it. Of course, I shan't be able to make the horror as real as he did, but perhaps I can catch a bit of the strangeness and glamour. He unscrewed his fountain pen and began to cover a sheet of paper with curious phrases. I shivered and closed the door. For several minutes, there was no sound in the room save the scratching of his pen as it moved across the paper. For several minutes, there was silence. And then the shrieks commenced. Or were they wails? We heard them through the closed door, heard them above the moaning of the foghorns and the wash of the waves on Mulligan's Beach. We heard them above the million sounds of night that had horrified and depressed us as we sat and talked in that fog-enshrouded and lonely house. We heard them so clearly that for a moment we thought they came from just outside the house. It was not until they came again and again, long, piercing wails, that we discovered in them a quality of remoteness. Slowly we became aware that the wails came from far away. As far away, perhaps, as Mulligan would. A soul in torture, muttered Howard. A poor damned soul in the grip of the horror I've been telling you about. The horror I've known and felt for years. He rose unsteadily to his feet. His eyes were shining, and he was breathing heavily. I seized his shoulders and shook him. You shouldn't project yourself into your stories that way, I exclaimed. Some poor chap is in distress. I don't know what's happened. Perhaps a ship foundered. I'm going to put on a slicker and find out what it's all about. I have an idea we may be needed. We may be needed, repeated Howard slowly. We may be needed indeed. It will not be satisfied with a single victim. Think of that great journey through space. The thirst and dreadful hungers it must have known. It is preposterous to imagine that it will be content with a single victim. Then suddenly a change came over him. The light went out of his eyes, and his voice lost its quiver. He shivered. Forgive me, he said. I'm afraid you'll think I'm as mad as the yokel who was here a few minutes ago. But I can't help identifying myself with the characters when I write. I describe something very evil. And those yells, well, they are exactly like the yells a man would make if... if... I understand, I interrupted. But we've no time to discuss that now. There's a poor chap out there, I pointed vaguely toward the door, with his back against the wall. He's fighting off something. I don't know what. We've got to help him. Of course, of course, he agreed, and followed me into the kitchen. Without a word, I took down a slicker and handed it to him. I also handed him an enormous rubber hat. Get into these as quickly as you can, I said. The chap's desperately in need of us. I had gotten my own slicker down from the rack and was forcing my arms through its sticky sleeves. In a moment, we were both pushing our way through the fog. The fog was like a living thing. Its long fingers reached up and slapped us relentlessly on the face. It curled about our bodies and ascended in great grayish spirals from the tops of our heads. It retreated before us and as suddenly closed in and enveloped us. Dimly ahead of us, we saw the lights of a few lonely farms. Behind us, the sea drummed, and the foghorn sent out a continuous, mournful ululation. The collar of Howard Slicker was turned up over his ears, and from his long nose, moisture dripped. There was grim decision in his eyes, and his jaw was set. For many minutes, we plodded on in silence, and it was not until we approached Mulligan Wood that he spoke. If necessary... He said, we shall enter the wood. I nodded. There is no reason why we should not enter the wood, I said. It isn't a large wood. One could get out quickly? 
One could get out very quickly indeed. My God, did you hear that? The shrieks had grown horribly loud. He is suffering. He is suffering terribly. Do you suppose... Do you suppose it's your crazy friend? He had voiced a question which I had been asking myself for some time. It's conceivable, I said. But we'll have to interfere if he's as mad as that. I wish I had brought some of the neighbors with me. Why in heaven's name didn't you? Howard shouted. It may take a dozen men to handle it. He was staring at the tall trees that towered before us, and I didn't think he really gave Henry Wells so much as a thought. That's Mulligan Wood, I said. I swallowed to keep my heart from rising to the top of my mouth. It isn't a big wood, I added idiotically. Oh my god! Out of the fog there came a sound of a voice in the last extremity of pain. They're eating up my brain! Oh my god! I was at that moment in deadly fear that I might become as mad as the man in the woods. I clutched Howard's arm. Let's go back, I shouted. Let's go back at once. We were fools to come. There is nothing here but madness and suffering and perhaps death. That may be, said Howard. But we're going on. His face was ashen beneath his dripping hat, and his eyes were thin blue slits. Very well, I said grimly. We'll go on. Slowly, we moved among the trees. They towered above us and the thick fog so distorted them and merged them together that they seemed to move forward with us. From their twisted branches, the fog hung in ribbons. Ribbons, did I say? Rather, were they snakes of fog, writhing snakes with venomous tongues and leering eyes. Through swirling clouds of fog, we saw the scaly gnarled boles of the trees, and every bowl resembled the twisted body of an evil old man. Only the small oblong of light cast by my electric torch protected us against their malevolence. Through great banks of fog we moved, and every moment the screams grew louder. Soon we were catching fragments of sentences, hysterical shoutings that merged into prolonged wails. Colder and colder and colder! They're eating up my brain! Colder! Ah! Howard gripped my arm. We'll find him, he said. We can't turn back now. When we found him, he was lying on his side. His hands were clasped about his head, and his body was bent double, the knees drawn up so tightly that they almost touched his chest. He was silent. We bent and shook him, but he made no sound. Is he dead? I choked out. I wanted desperately to turn and run. The trees were very close to us. I don't know, said Howard. I don't know. I hope that he is dead. I saw him kneel and slide his hand under the poor devil's shirt. For a moment his face was a mask. Then he got up quickly and shook his head. He is alive, he said. We must get him into some dry clothes as quickly as possible. The droning did not commence until we had left the wood. At first, we scarcely heard it. It was so low, like the purring of gigantic engines far down in the earth. But slowly, as we stumbled forward with our burden, it grew so loud that we could not ignore it. What is that? muttered Howard. And through the wraiths of fog, I saw that his face had a greenish tinge. I don't know, I mumbled. It's something horrible. I never heard anything like it. Can't you walk faster? So far, we had been fighting familiar horrors, but the droning and humming that rose behind us was like nothing that I had ever heard on earth. In excruciating fright, I shrieked aloud, Faster, Howard, faster! For God's sake, let's get out of this! As I spoke, the body that we were carrying squirmed, and from its cracked lips issued a torrent of gibberish. I was walking between the trees, looking up, I couldn't see their tops. I was looking up, and then suddenly I looked down, and the thing landed on my shoulders. It was all legs, all long, crawling legs. It went right into my head. I wanted to get away from the trees when I couldn't. 
I was alone in the forest with the thing on my back, in my head, and when I tried to run, the trees reached out and tripped me. It made a hole so that it could get in. It's my brain it wants. Today it made a hole, and now it's crawled in, and it's sucking and sucking and sucking. It's as cold as ice, and it makes a noise like a great big fly. But it isn't a fly. It isn't a hand. I was wrong when I called it a hand. You can't see it. I wouldn't have seen or felt it if it hadn't made a hole and got in. You almost see it. You almost feel it. And that means it's getting ready to go in. Can you walk, Wells? Can you walk? Howard had dropped Wells' legs, and I could hear the harsh intake of his breath as he struggled to rid himself of his slicker. I think so, Wells sobbed. But it doesn't matter. It's got me now. Put me down and save yourselves. We've got to run, I yelled. It's our one chance, cried Howard. Wells, you follow us. Follow us, do you understand? They'll burn up your brain if they catch you. We're going to run, lad. Follow us. He was off through the fog. Wells shook himself free and followed like a man in a trance. I felt a horror more terrible than death. The noise was dreadfully loud. It was right in my ears, and yet for a moment I couldn't move. The wall of fog was growing thicker. Frank will be lost. It was the voice of Wells, raised in a despairing shout. We'll go back, it was Howard shouting now. It's death or worse, but we can't leave him. Keep on, I called out. They won't get me. Save yourselves. In my anxiety to prevent them from sacrificing themselves, I plunged wildly forward. In a moment, I had joined Howard and was clutching at his arm. What is it, I cried. What have we to fear? The droning was all about us now, but no louder. Come quickly, or we'll be lost, he urged frantically. They've broken down all barriers. That buzzing is a warning. We're sensitives. We've been warned, but if it gets louder, we're lost. They're strong near Mulligan Wood, and it's here they've made themselves felt. They're experimenting now, feeling their way. Later, when they've learned, they'll spread out. If we can only reach the farm. We'll reach the farm, I shouted as I clawed my way through the fog. Heaven help us if we don't, moaned Howard. He had thrown off his slicker and his seeping wet shirt clung tragically to his lean body. He moved through the blackness with long, furious strides. Far ahead, we heard the shrieks of Henry Wells. Ceaselessly, the foghorns moaned. Ceaselessly, the fog swirled and eddied about us. And the droning continued. It seemed incredible that we should ever have found a way to the farm in the blackness. But find the farm we did, and into it we stumbled with glad cries. Shut the door! shouted Howard. I shut the door. We are safe here, I think, he said. They haven't reached the farm yet. What has happened to Wells? I gasped. And then I saw the wet tracks leading into the kitchen. Howard saw them too. His eyes flashed with momentary relief. I'm glad he's safe, he muttered. I feared for him. Then his face darkened. The kitchen was unlighted, and no sound came from it. Without a word, Howard walked across the room and into the darkness beyond. I sank into a chair, flicked the moisture from my eyes, and brushed back my hair, which had fallen in soggy strands across my face. For a moment I sat, breathing heavily, and when the door creaked, I shivered. But I remembered Howard's assurance. They haven't reached the farm yet. We're safe here. Somehow I had confidence in Howard. He realized that we were threatened by a new and unknown horror, and in some occult way he had grasped its limitations. I confess, though, that when I heard the screams that came from the kitchen, my faith in my friend was slightly shaken. There were low growls, such as I could not believe came from any human throat and the voice of Howard raised in wild expostulation. Let go, I say! Are you quite mad? Man, we have saved you! Don't, I say, let go of my leg! Ah! As Howard staggered into the room, I sprang forward and caught him in my arms. He was covered with blood from head to foot, and his face was ashen. He's gone raving mad, he moaned. 
He was running about on his hands and knees like a dog. He sprang at me and almost killed me. I fought him off, but I'm badly bitten. I hit him in the face, knocked him unconscious. I may have killed him. He's an animal. I had to protect myself. I laid Howard on the sofa and knelt beside him, but he scorned my aid. Don't bother with me, he commanded. Get a rope, quickly, and tie him up. If he comes to, we'll have to fight for our lives. What followed was a nightmare. I remember vaguely that I went into the kitchen with a rope and tied poor Wells to a chair. Then I bathed and dressed Howard's wounds and lit a fire in the grate. I remember also that I telephoned for a doctor. But the incidents are confused in my memory and I have no clear recollection of anything until the arrival of a tall, grave man with kindly and sympathetic eyes and a presence that was as soothing as an opiate. He examined Howard, nodded, and explained that the wounds were not serious. He examined Wells and did not nod. He explained slowly. His pupils don't respond to light, he said. An immediate operation will be necessary. I tell you frankly, I don't think we can save him. That wound in his head, doctor, I said. Was it made by a bullet? The doctor frowned. It puzzles me, he said. Of course, it was made by a bullet, but it should have partially closed up. It goes right into the brain. You say you know nothing about it. I believe you, but I think the authorities should be notified at once. Someone will be wanted for manslaughter. Unless... He paused. Unless the wound was self-inflicted. What you tell me is curious. That he should have been able to walk about for hours seems incredible. The wound has obviously been dressed, too. There's no clotted blood at all. He paced slowly back and forth. We must operate here, at once. There is a slight chance. Luckily, I brought some instruments. We must clear this table, and do you think you could hold a lamp for me? I nodded. I'll try, I said. Good. The doctor busied himself with preparations while I debated whether or not I should phone for the police. I'm convinced, I said at last, that the wound was self-inflicted. Wells acted very strangely. If you are willing, doctor, yes, we will remain silent about this matter until after the operation. If Wells lives, there would be no need of involving the poor chap in a police investigation. The doctor nodded. Very well, he said. We will operate first and decide afterward. Howard was laughing silently from his couch. The police, he snickered. Of what use would they be against the things in Mulligan Wood? There was an ironic and ominous quality about his mirth that disturbed me. The horrors that we had known in the fog seemed absurd and impossible in the cool, scientific presence of Dr. Smith, and I didn't want to be reminded of them. The doctor turned from his instruments and whispered into my ear, Your friend has a slight fever, and apparently it has made him delirious. If you will bring me a glass of water, I will mix him a sedative. I raced to secure a glass, and in a moment, we had Howard sleeping soundly. Now then, said the doctor as he handed me the lamp, you must hold this steady and move it about as I direct. The white, unconscious form of Henry Wells lay upon the table that the doctor and I had cleared, and I trembled all over when I thought of what lay before me. I should be obliged to stand and gaze into the living brain of my poor friend as the doctor relentlessly laid it bare. With swift, experienced fingers, the doctor administered an anesthetic. I was oppressed by the dreadful feeling that we were committing a crime, that Henry Wells would have violently disapproved, that he would have preferred to die. It is a dreadful thing to mutilate a man's brain, and yet I knew that the doctor's conduct was above reproach and that the ethics of his profession demanded that he operate. We are ready, said Dr. Smith. Lower the lamp. Carefully now. I lowered the lamp an inch without turning my head. I waited for him to reproach me, to swear at me perhaps, but he was as silent as the man on the table. I knew, though, that his fingers were still at work, 
for I could hear them as he moved about. I could hear his swift, agile fingers moving about the head of Henry Wells. I suddenly became conscious that my hand was trembling. I wanted to lay down the lamp. I felt that I could no longer hold it. Are you nearly through? I gasped in desperation. Hold that lamp steady, the doctor screamed the command. If you move that lamp again, I won't sew him up. I don't care if they hang me. I'm not a healer of devils. I knew not what to do. I could scarcely hold the lamp, and the doctor's threat horrified me. Do everything you can, I urged hysterically. Give him a chance to fight his way back. He was kind and good, once. For a moment there was silence, and I feared that he would not heed me. I momentarily expected him to throw down his scalpel and sponge and dash across the room and out into the fog. It was not until I heard his fingers moving about again that I knew he had decided to give even the damned a chance. It was after midnight when the doctor told me that I could lay down the lamp. I turned with a cry of relief and encountered a face that I shall never forget. In three quarters of an hour, the doctor had aged ten years. There were dark hollows beneath his eyes, and his mouth twitched convulsively. He'll not live, he said. He'll be dead in an hour. I did not touch his brain. I could do nothing. When I saw how things were, I, I sewed him up immediately. What did you see? I half whispered. A look of unutterable fear came into the doctor's eyes. I saw... I saw...